This video is sponsored by Ground News. Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for October 2023 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks and then we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. This month we're chatting about the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2023, plus JWST has found native carbon on Jupiter's moon at Europa, plus free-floating rogue planets in pairs that are orbiting each other rather than orbiting around any stars. There's chapter markers down here if you want to skip ahead to any of those specific news stories, plus any scientific research articles I mention are all going to be linked in the video description down below, free to read. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. Now first up, on Saturday the 14th of October there's going to be an annular solar eclipse for those of you in the Americas. Now annular meaning ring rather than annual as in once a year because the moon is going to be slightly too far away in its oval shaped orbit to fully block the sun's light so we'll still get a ring of light around the moon at the peak of the eclipse so it won't get properly dark like in a total solar eclipse when the moon fully blocks the sun it'll still be as bright as like a you know very cloudy day but it's still going to be great to try and watch this safely so the eclipse shadow path goes from the west coast of the u.s down through texas central america colombia and brazil i'll pop a link in the description so you can put in your location and find out what time on saturday this is happening for you and how much of the sun will be blocked eclipses always come in pairs though with a partial lunar eclipse two weeks later for those of us in Europe, Africa and Asia. This is when the moon passes into the Earth's shadow and can turn a reddish colour. There's two parts to the Earth's shadow though. There's the umbra, the central region where the light from the sun is fully blocked but you sort of get light refracting through the Earth's atmosphere onto the moon which is what turns it red. It's kind of like a, a sunset shadow if you will. And then you've got the outer part of the shadow called the penumbra which is essentially caused by the fact that the sun is isn't a point source of light, it is actually coming from quite a large region and so there are some parts of the sun's light that still make it around the earth and some that don't, it's just slightly more shadowed than normal. So for this eclipse the moon will just dip into that umbra, the inner part of the earth's shadow, so only a part of it will go ever so slightly orange. The rest of the moon will just sort of get a little bit dimmer, it won't look as bright as normal but actually that is really useful because while the eclipse is happening the moon will be very close to the planet planet Jupiter on the sky. So you'll be able to use the moon as a waypoint to find Jupiter, but then the moon will be less bright than normal, so making Jupiter easier to spot because the moon's light won't wash it out. Now the two will be around about three degrees apart from each other, which is sort of two to three fingers held at arm's length in front of you, which is close enough that both of them will fit in the field of view of binoculars so that you can observe them at the same time. So Jupiter is incredibly bright right now and it won't just be visible on that night with the moon, but all through the weeks of October and November in the run up to it reaching what's known as opposition on the 3rd of November, where it'll be in the exact opposite position from the sun in the sky so it'll be perfectly lit from our perspective and also the closest it ever gets to earth so the brightest it can get on the sky. It really is quite dazzling Jupiter at opposition like it almost doesn't look real it just looks like it's sort of hanging there in the sky like a drone or a plane coming in to land. It's visible like the next two months all night from wherever you are in the world. I even managed to see it from New York City last week as well. It was that bright. So make sure and look out for it. Once you have spotted it, try turning 90 degrees to the west and see if you can also find Saturn with its characteristic yellowish colour before it sets in the early morning. Next up, on the night of Friday the 20th of October going into the morning of Saturday the 21st of October, we've got the peak of the Orionids meteor shower, which is caused by Earth passing through a load of dust and debris left behind by Halley's Comet. And all that debris burns up in Earth's atmosphere, producing shooting stars across the sky. In the darkest of skies, you're looking at around about 10 to 20 meteors an hour for the Orionids meteor shower. So what, that's like, you know, a meteor every three to six minutes. So it's not the most active of meteor showers, but the moon this year on that night of sort of the Friday the 20th going into Saturday the 21st is a half moon. So it should 
set around about midnight, meaning those early morning hours should be nice and dark for meteor spotting. The best thing to do if you want to try and catch this is just to look directly upwards. So, you know, just grab a blanket, pop it on the ground, wrap it warm and make a night of it. And finally, for all those early morning rises, on the 23rd of October, Venus reaches what's known as its greatest western elongation. Essentially, the furthest it gets from the sun from our perspective here on Earth, meaning Venus reaches its highest possible altitude in the sky before the sun rises. Now, Venus is the brightest thing in the night sky after the moon. So it really is a spectacular sight to see, especially when it is so high above the horizon. So if you are an early riser and you're up before the dawn, which, you know, the dawn is getting later and later for those of us here in the northern hemisphere, look towards that glow of the sunrise in the east and see if you can spot it high in the sky above it. All right, that's it for looking up at the night sky. But before we chat about what's been happening in space news, I'm excited to tell you about the app and the website I've been using to get my news lately, Ground News, who are sponsoring this video. Ground News is the brainchild of former NASA aerospace engineer Harleen Kaur, who even worked on JWST. She created this app and website that combines articles from all around the world so that we can compare coverage and see things like political affiliation, who owns the publication, and how factual their reporting tends to be. For example, the big news this month was the Nobel Prize announcements in physics, medicine, chemistry, peace, and literature. And on the Ground News website, we can see there's over 200 articles published on this in the last four days, mainly from highly factual sources. It's really important, especially in science, that we don't filter the information that we share or have access to. And that's why I think what Ground News are doing is so important. It even helps us challenge some of our own assumptions too, with this feature called My News Bias, which shows you an analysis of your own news diet. So go to Ground dot news forward slash Dr. Becky and check them out. You can subscribe through my link for as little as $1 a month, or you can get 30% off unlimited access. So a big thanks again to Ground News for sponsoring this video. I highly recommend that you check them out. The link is in the video description down below. And now let's come back down to earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. So as we just heard, the big news in physics this month was the Nobel Prize announcement. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physics to Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Krauss and Anne Lier for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. So let's unpack this, starting first with what an attosecond is. So atto is a prefix like milli, so a millisecond is a thousandth of a second. An attosecond is a billionth of a billionth of a second. And just to give you a sense of scale on how small an attosecond really is, the ratio between an attosecond and a second is the same as the ratio between a second and the age of the universe at 13.7 billion years old, or around about 4 billion billion seconds. And what you do in attophysics is generate incredibly rapid light pulses that only last for a few attoseconds. So the current record is a pulse lasting just 43 attoseconds. So why would you want to do that? Well, it's to observe things that move on incredibly short timeframes. Think of it kind of like video, right? Video is taken at 30 frames a second. So 30 images taken every second, which are then played back to back. So it looks like smooth motion to our eyes. But if you've got something that moves faster than that, then you'll see it in one frame and you'll see it jump into the next frame. You're not entirely sure how it's moved from one to the next. It could have been a straight line movement or it could have zipped around in the intervening time. Electrons move incredibly fast, but with attosecond light pulses, you're actually seeing them on the time scales they actually move. So you can see, did they do a straight line jump or did they zip around? And you can finally watch electrons move 
essentially in real time. Now, the laureates that won the prize won for their contributions to how these pulses are generated. So much more of like the physics of how to generate these pulses rather than the applications of this technique, which range from everything from watching electron behavior in chemical reactions to, you know, seeing tiny changes in molecules in a blood sample and even diagnosing various different medical conditions. So it's very far removed from astrophysics and my field of research of black holes. So if you do want more on this, then check out this great conversation article by Professor Amel Zaire, which I'll link below. Similarly, CERN had some big particle physics news this month. They actually confirmed that antimatter falls down under the influence of gravity and not up. It behaves the same as normal matter, essentially, which you might not have expected considering anti- matter. I actually went to the antimatter factory at CERN and chatted to April Cridland about this exact experiment if you want to check that video out. And for an explanation on what's now been found, check out particle physicist Clara Nellist's YouTube channel. Again, I'll link both of those things down below. But back to space and some astrophysics now. And let's start with this incredible time lapse of a Martian dust devil captured by the Perseverance rover. So a dust devil is a little bit like a tornado, just not as intense. They form sort of in sunny conditions rather than on the back of thunderstorms like tornadoes do. And they're fairly common here on Earth and on Mars as well. They were first spotted on Mars in images taken by the Viking probes in the early 1980s. And since then, they've been spotted from satellites like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and by Curiosity and Perseverance rover as well. There's always been the odd worry that dust devils, if they were intense enough, could cause some damage to a lander or a probe or a rover that you had on the surface of Mars. Actually, they've been found to be sometimes quite useful because they can actually clear dust on solar panels as well. What's interesting about this one that Perseverance rover spotted on the 30th of August 2023 from around about four kilometers away is that even though only the bottom of the dust devil is visible and you can work out that it's around about 60 meters wide and about 118 meters tall, but from the shadow cast by the dust devil onto the Martian surface, the Perseverance team worked out that it was actually over two kilometers high. That's way, way higher than any dust devil we've ever observed here on Earth. So this dust devil and the images that Perseverance has, has got will help in studies of the differences between Earth's atmosphere and the Martian atmosphere. From Mars to the Moon now, and those who watched last month's Night Sky News will know that there was some hope that ISRO's Chandrayaan-3 lander would wake up when it got back into sunlight again, but sadly that doesn't seem to be the case. There's been many attempts to try and contact the lander, but no signal has been received. So there won't be any extension to the Chandrayaan-3 mission. It has done its sort of normal mission that was fully planned, taken all the data that it wanted to, but there will be no extension and no further data. And now all we'll have to do is just wait for the results of the original mission to be published. Now, sticking in the solar system, the big news this month was the return to Earth of the OSIRIS-REx mission with its asteroid sample collected from the surface of Bennu. A pristine asteroid sample that's not been contaminated by falling through Earth's atmosphere or hitting the surface of the Earth, like meteorites, for example. And so now, because it is so pristine, there's so many tests and much analysis that we can do to answer some big science questions. I actually made a whole video already on what tests NASA are planning to do and what science questions they're trying to answer. I'll link that below in the description if you want to check it out. But for now, I'm filming this on Monday the 9th of October. And the news so far from NASA seems to be that there's a lot more asteroid sample than we originally thought that's not just in the main sample container, but that it's been collected outside of it as well, which is great news. And NASA are planning to reveal to the public what that sample looks like and also some initial analysis as well on Wednesday the 11th of October. So I'm going to hand over now to future Becky. All right, it's now very late on Wednesday and we got our first glimpse of what the sample looks like and what it's made of at the press conference earlier this afternoon. The first carbon measurement, the actual number is 4.7%, uh, close to 5%. Um, and this was a big deal. Um, at the time this data came back, I mean, there were scientists on the team going, wow. The left side is the first look at the tag SAM. So you've got the science canister. That's like the vault that protected the sample on the return journey home. Here I'm just showing you four different examples. This is taken with an electron microscope. 
Electrons kind of behave like light waves, but they have much shorter wavelengths, so you can see very, very fine details that you would never be able to see with an optical microscope. Water-bearing clay minerals, and they have this fibrous kind of structure. We call this serpentine, because they look like serpents or snakes inside the sample. And they have water locked inside their crystal structure. And I want to stop and think about what that means. That water that is how we think water got to the Earth. So you saw there in the images all that black dust that was coating the capsule. That was like bumper crop that we weren't expecting to collect from Bennu. So it was great to see how much of a sample we actually have to work with and how much, so much larger than we ever thought. Plus also that initial analysis showing water already and also that much higher carbon content than anybody expected. Like we expected some carbon because we know Bennu is a carbon rich asteroid, but that much at 4.7% is incredible. And it really does add sort of very strong evidence to that hypothesis, the idea that asteroid impacts brought water and the ingredients for life to the early Earth. So very exciting initial results, but now I'm even more excited for when the actual detailed results of the analysis of this sample from Bennu get published, hopefully in a few months time. Now that OSIRIS-REx's primary mission is done, the spacecraft that jettisoned that sample capsule back to Earth has now been renamed OSIRIS Apex for its second mission to do a flyby of the near-Earth asteroid 99942 Apophis, which is potentially hazardous to Earth. Apophis makes a close pass to Earth on the 13th of April 2029, just 32,000 kilometers above Earth's surface, which is closer than the distance that geostationary satellites orbit at. So during that incredibly close pass of Apophis, Osiris Apex will observe at sort of like a safe distance. And then a week later on the 21st of April, 2029, it will go into orbit around Apophis for around about 18 months or so to study it in great detail, which is really exciting because it's a completely different type of asteroid to Bennu. Bennu is like a carbon rich asteroid, whereas Apophis is more of like a stony asteroid. So we've got a lot to look forward to with Osiris Rex and Osiris Apex. We've got that sample analysis from the asteroid Bennu, but also we've got the results from Osiris Apex to look forward to as well. Moving on now to the first of two new JWST results, because this month two papers were published, one from Villanueva and collaborators and the other by Trumbo and Brown. And they used JWST data to show that native carbon exists on Jupiter's moon Europa. And that got a lot of people excited. So why is this such a big deal? Well, Europa is one of those places in the solar system that we think could have the right conditions for life. It's thought to have a water ice crust with a salty water ocean below it that's kept liquid essentially by internal heat from the moon itself. And in 2012, Roth and collaborators observed Europa with the Hubble Space Telescope and found evidence for water plumes, like a geyser erupting from the South Pole of Europa. So that suggests that subsurface ocean is also connected to the surface on Europa, which means you are going to have mixing of any molecules and nutrients if there is life present. Now, life here on Earth, as we know it, the only form of life that we know, is carbon-based. So if you are going to have life somewhere, you're going to need the ingredients for life, and the main one is carbon, at least that we know to look for. Now, carbon has been found on Europa before in the form of carbon dioxide, ice, by, for example, Hansen and McCord in 2008 with the Galileo spacecraft. But the data they had was too noisy to be able to trace the source of that carbon. For example, could it have come from asteroids impacting with the surface of Europa and depositing carbon there? Or is it actually native to Europa itself, perhaps coming from the ocean and deposited there by any of these plumes? So that's what these two research teams hoped to answer, independently analyzing the exact same imaging and spectroscopic data from JWST. Now, Villanueva and collaborators used the data to search for evidence of plumes ejected from Europa, but couldn't 
find anything. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't exist at all. The fact that they didn't find any here doesn't negate the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope found them back in 2012, but it probably means is that the plumes are actually very variable, and sometimes they're more active and sometimes they're less active. And in this case, perhaps they're not very active, and so they're below the limits of what we're able to detect with JWST. And then both Villeneuve and collaborators and Trumbo and Brown analyze the spectra from the near spec detector on JWST, which is where you split the light into its component wavelengths. If you do this with visible light, you get a rainbow because the different wavelengths are different colors. See, with infrared light, you just get the shorter wavelengths and the longer wavelengths. But what you see is essentially a trace of how much light at each wavelength you receive. And what you can then look for is where there are gaps, where there is light missing because a molecule like carbon dioxide or water has absorbed that light, stolen it away at a very specific wavelength that is unique to that molecule. So you can look in the JWST spectra for the ones that are unique to carbon dioxide, for example, and the deeper the drop, the more carbon dioxide that's there doing the absorbing. Both teams then mapped out how much carbon dioxide ice they found across Europa. They both found that it wasn't evenly spread, but instead heavily concentrated in a few regions, including one called Tara Regio, a large region of what's known as chaos terrain, where the surface is cracked, ridged, and very jumbled. Now, it's not just on Europa that we see chaos terrain, we see it across the entire solar system as well, but we're not entirely sure what causes it. We're pretty sure it's not asteroid impacts because you don't see a lot of craters. The, the surface seems to be very young. And so on Europa, what we think it might be is pressure from the ocean below on the crust. Obviously, a lot of that is then escaping as plumes or even interaction with Jupiter through tidal forces that can either crack the surface or even push it together, similarly to plate tectonics. Either way, you've got an interaction of the icy crust with the ocean below. So because the majority of the carbon dioxide ice was found here in Tara Reggio, this chaos terrain, by both independent research groups. It's thought that the carbon is native to Europa itself, rather than being brought by asteroid impacts that deposited that carbon on the surface, because those would be very sporadic, very randomly distributed, and what you would end up with is quite a smooth distribution of carbon dioxide on the surface, rather than the very concentrated distribution, which is actually what the teams have found. So it's a very exciting result to find native carbon on a moon of Jupiter that's thought to possibly be habitable to life. And it comes just in time for planning for ESA's JUICE mission to explore three of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, which launched back in April 2023 and should arrive at the Jupiter system in 2031 and then NASA's Europa Clipper mission, which will conduct 44 separate flybys of Europa, all at different distances from the surface, to study it in greater detail, to figure out what's going on on the surface. What is this chaos terrain? What's causing it? And also, if there is any plume activity, how variable is the plume activity? And if there is some plumes, can also fly through the plume to work out what it's made of. So that's due for launch in October 2024 and should arrive at Europa in April 2030. And finally, let's chat about this research published this month by Pearson and McCochran, who have found 540 free floating planets in a cluster of stars in the Orion Nebula. Now, you might be very familiar with the Orion Nebula. It's visible with the naked eye as a smudge under the three bright stars of Orion's belt. But break out binoculars or a telescope, though, and you start to see color and way more detail. But of course, JWST puts everything else to shame at the minute, whether that is an amateur telescope or another professional telescope. Capturing these incredible mosaic images, one taken at shorter wavelengths showing the much warmer regions around stars, and one at much longer wavelengths showing the cooler regions of dust and gas. Now this is actually a mosaic of many JWST near cam images all stitched together. It's seven times wider and two times higher than the typical field of view 
of Neocam, which hopefully gives you some sense of scale of how big of an area of sky this actually is. Now, because of how relatively nearby the Orion Nebula is, it's around about 1,300 light years away, and because the Trapezium Cluster is found at its very center, which is 2,000 newly formed stars, it means the Orion Nebula is the perfect place to study both star and planet formation. And so in the first of two papers from Pearson and McCochrane that was published this month, they pick out some cool features that you can see in this JWST image, like these stars with dusty disks around them where planets are likely forming, to stars with outflows throwing out gas from their poles as they form, or even these stars with these unexplained dark rings around them dubbed coffee stains. But their biggest finding was the 540 planetary mass objects that they found. So they're not big enough or hot enough to kickstart nuclear fusion, so these things are either like brown dwarfs or even planets like Jupiter. Now, because they're so small, they don't reflect a lot of light. So they're usually very difficult to actually find and see. But when they're newly formed, they're still quite hot from the gas being crushed under immense pressures. And so they still glow in infrared wavelengths that JWST can detect. And from how bright they appear in these infrared wavelengths, you can estimate roughly how massive they are. So not only did Pearson and McCochran find 540 of these objects in this one image of the Orion Nebula, just free floating, either because, you know, they formed there in situ in the same way that stars form, you know, just collapsing gas downwards, or they formed sort of in one of those dusty disks around a star like a planet does and then were ejected out of that. So not only did they find those, but they also found that 9% of these things were also in pairs, a binary system orbiting each other. So here's five examples of that in just like one area of this image. And hopefully what you can see in each of these insets here is there's very clearly two dots in each case. Now, Pearson and McCochran dubbed these jumbos, Jupiter mass binary objects. And the discovery of these was completely unexpected because their existence breaks a trend that at least exists for stars, that as you drop to lower and lower mass stars, the number of stars you actually find in a binary pair drops off. But now, Pearson and McCochran have found that that sort of fraction of the amount of objects in a binary system increases again as you get to even lower masses closer to Jupiter's mass. Now, all of this rests on the idea that these are actually true binary systems and not just a chance alignment of two objects with one in the foreground and one in the background. But what you can do is sort of work out from the amount of these planetary mass objects you actually find in this given area, what the probability of a chance alignment would be and therefore how many you would expect to find. And Pearson and McCochran work out that they should expect to find just three chance alignment binary pairs and they actually find more like 50. So it is likely that a few of these are chance alignments but clearly not all of them. So that means these are a huge problem for our models. Either they formed like stars do, just collapsing from gas clouds down, in which case our models cannot explain why at these such low masses you end up with such a large fraction of them in pairs, or they formed like planets in a dusty disk around a star and then got ejected, which is very common for single planets, but for it to happen to two planets at once and for them to either remain bound as they got ejected or somehow bind themselves to each other in the pair once ejected is again something that our models can't really explain right now. Now, follow-up observations to get spectra of these objects with JWST are planned for spring 2024, which should hopefully reveal which ones were formed like stars or which ones were formed like planets, and then we should be able to refine those models much better. But for now, we don't understand these weird pairs of free-floating planets, these jumbos, but who doesn't love a good astrophysics mystery? All right, that's it for Night Sky News for November. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky, I would love to see them. Plus, if you see any space news stories that you want me to explain in a future video, then send them my way over on social media. Heads up that I am gonna be taking a two week break at the end of October, so I won't be as active on my social media platforms during that time. Plus, there's gonna be a week 
maybe two weeks where you don't see a video from me on YouTube either. But I will be back in November with more Night Sky news. So until next time, everybody, happy stargazing. So instead of a total solar eclipse, Claps. <laughs> the Orionids meteor shower. So what's that's like three to six meteors every no a meteor every three to six minutes. Not three to six meteors every minute. Three to six meteors every minute. No, a meteor every three to a meteor every three to six minutes. Finally, dust off the solar pa solar panels in this uh, sample return pod uh, capsule capsules. Twitter, I'm looking for during that close fly by fly fly by fly by how much light at each wavelength wavelength wavelengths wavelengths at certain wavelengths where oh, I'm saying wavelengths far too many now because of how nearby the Orion Nebula is how close actually is it how close is the Orion Nebula Bedia, tell me how far away it is 1344 plus or minus 20 light years I will always be thousand light years away. Sorry, the national distracted me. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So they do glow in infrared. Infrared. <laughs> Knew that was going to happen at some point today. Oh, this nail is annoying me. You see how much my nails are chipped? I only did them yesterday. Look at that. Awful. Absolutely awful. Shocking. Shocking. Do them again. Oh.